Some railways are remembered for being the first in their country to open, some are remembered for being the first in the world to use steam power, and some are remembered for being the first to traverse certain difficult routes. To this day, however, there still exists one little railway that holds the unique title of being the first railway in the world to be preserved. It's not some historically significant rail line, nor is it a rail line that revolutionised travel, but rather a small, unassuming slate railway on the coast of Wales. In the early 1800s, slate quarrying started to become a big industry in Wales. The slate industry remained steady until 1861, when the American Civil War broke out, cutting off supplies of cotton to the mills of northwest England that depended on it. Many mill owners decided to look elsewhere for enterprise, and some turned their attention to the slate mines of Wales. One of these quarries was the Brenegg Lewis Quarry near Abergann which was taken over by William McConnell. At the time, the quarry primarily transported slate to Penn by horse, but McConnell felt that output from Brenegg Lewis could be significantly improved with better transport. He put in plans to build a railway from the quarry to Tawin, and from there to the port in Aberdiffy. By 1863, however, the Aberystwyth and Welsh Coast Railway had reached Tawin, and so plans were scaled back to just build the line between Tawin and the quarry. The track was built to the unusual gauge of 2 foot 3 inches, and in 1864, two locomotives were ordered from Fletcher Jennings & Co. to work the line the first being delivered that same year and the second arriving in 1866. In 1865, the railway was permitted to operate passenger trains. Upon inspection, however, it was found some aspects of the line made it unfit to transport passengers, such as some of the bridges having inadequate clearance on either side of the carriages, making it difficult to exit the carriages should the train ever have to stop. To solve this, the rails were shifted to one side and the carriage doors to the right were fixed shut, providing passengers with enough space to exit in these tight spaces, but also meant the carriages could only be entered from one side. On top of this, the two locomotives also required further modifications to make them safer, with number one, Tally Hlyn, having a set of trailing wheels fitted to stop excessive vertical motion, and number two, Dol Goch, having its springs and crank pins adjusted to stop excessive horizontal motion. After this, the line was declared fit for service and was officially opened to the public in 1866. For the next few decades, the line ran without incident, and helped boost the productivity of the quarry. Extra stops were added along the line for passengers, and it even proved to be very popular with tourists. By 1910, however, the future wasn't looking so bright. Demand for slate fell dramatically, and the quarry was only producing half the amount it initially did. With the money gone, McConnell saw no use in renewing his lease on the land. This caused quite a stir around Abergann as the quarry was the largest employer in the area. Area. Local Liberal MP Henry Hayden Jones saw the concern and stepped up to buy the quarry. He kept both it and the railway running, but barely turned a profit from the endeavour, with the line mostly making money from tourists. The slate and seasonal holiday trains kept the railway going, but by 1946, a massive collapse in the quarry led to it being shut down. Hayden Jones vowed that the railway would run as long as he lived, and as such, passenger services continued, albeit only for two days a week. Jones eventually died in 1950. On top of this, the Talichlin was one of the few railways that wasn't nationalised in 1947, meaning the railway was left without an owner. At this point, the line was a mess, the rails were worn, and both the engines were hardly fit for service. Number 2, Dolgoch, was the only engine running, and had to be sent away for repairs multiple times. Meanwhile, number 1, Talichlin, was so worn out that its firebox and boiler were deemed beyond use or further repair, with it still carrying its original boiler from 1864. It was only steamed in emergencies and ran at low pressure, being described as less of an engine and more of a self-propelled bomb. While this would be the end for most railways, something unusual happened. Author Tom Rolt had visited the line in 1949, and after hearing the news of its impending closure, wrote a letter to the Birmingham Post saying what a shame it would be to lose the line after nearly 85 years of service, calling for a rescue of the railway. Surprisingly, a large number of people backed the idea, including wealthy business owner Patrick Whitehouse. A committee soon formed headed by Rolton Whitehouse, and negotiations started started with Hayden's executors on acquisition of the line. The Talichlin Railway Preservation Society soon took ownership, and began publicising its efforts to try to raise money and awareness of its mission to keep the line running. By May of 1951, 650 people had joined, and the railway was running again. It wasn't just locals either. 
For some reason, people from all over the country just didn't want this little Welsh railway to close. Running the railway, however, was much easier said than done. Dolgok was the only engine able to operate passenger services, and worked like a dog trying to keep the trains going. Fortunately, the Talichlin managed to acquire two more engines from the recently closed Corris Railway. Number 3 and Number 4, renamed Sir Hayden and Edward Thomas respectively, were brought to the Talichlin to take over the work of the now completely worn out Dolgok. Edward Thomas was in need of an overhaul itself, and as the railway hadn't the money to do it, John Alcock of the Hunslet Engine Company kindly offered to do it for free as a show of support. Sir Hayden was mostly used to run the railway with Dolgok. Though it was capable of doing the work, Sir Hayden kept coming off the rails. Nobody knew why, as the Corris Railway was also 2 foot 3 inches, same as the Tally Clin, until it was found that the line was built half an inch wider than it should have been to accommodate Number 1's longer wheelbase. Talichlin and Dolgok had both been given wider wheel treads to help compensate for the difference. This meant the entire line needed relaying to its correct gauge. In the meantime, Sir Hayden was given broader wheels to amend the issue. By 1953, word had spread far and wide of the Little Welsh Railway that was being kept open out of passion. Tom Rolt had written the book Railway Adventure based on his experience at the Talichlin, which worked as the inspiration for the film The Titfield Thunderbolt. This not only helped boost the Tally Clin's popularity, but also inspired others to do the same for their local railways. Kit Davidson, an American filmmaker, also came and filmed the railway, producing the short documentary Railway with a Heart of Gold. This publicity helped the railway gain more visitors, which in turn increased popularity and provided the railway with much needed revenue. Not only did this allow them to relay the line, but also meant they could afford a diesel to help with the work, as well as get both Talichlin and Dolgok back into working order. Another engine, Douglas, was donated in 1953, having formerly worked at RAF Calshot, and in 1957, the BBC made a broadcast about the railway, boosting publicity even further. As the line developed, a museum was opened at Tawin, featuring various different displays and locomotives from all over the country, as well as detailing the history of the railway. While it might not sound like much nowadays, a railway run entirely by volunteers was something practically unheard of at the time. The idea that people were taking time out of their day to lay rails and run trains for no pay at all was bizarre, but kindled a feeling of camaraderie among many rail enthusiasts. The chance to work on or drive an engine yourself was also an appealing factor to many, but most that worked the line simply just did it out of love. One of these volunteers was Reverend Wilbert Audrey. Audrey filled in as the guard for the Tally Clin, and fictionalised the engines of the line in several of his railway series books. The massive success of his books, combined with the scenery of the railway, has since guaranteed its survival. The railway was even permitted to dress up the engines as their fictional counterparts for special days out. Audrey and the railway continued to work with each other until his death in 1997. Afterwards, part of his study and his model railway were donated to the museum at Tawin, where they have since remained on display. Since then, the railway has become famous the world over, attracting tourists from across the globe to come and take a ride along seven miles of beautiful Welsh scenery. For over 150 years, the line and its engines have run from the coast to the hills, and proudly continue to do so to this day, still surviving on donations and the work of volunteers. What was once just another decrepit slate railway has since become a global tourist attraction. The week this video releases, the railway will be hosting the Audrey Extravaganza, a celebration of Reverend Audrey's work on both the Railway series and the Tally Clin. I'll be there milling around, taking photos, and basking in the wonderful Welsh weather, so if you happen to see me, feel free to say hello, if you can figure out what I look like. The Tally Clin Railway started its life as nothing special, just a little line to carry slate, but thanks to years of effort, has become an icon of railway preservation. A bunch of people getting together to preserve a railway had never been done before, and the Tally Clin proved that it was possible, making way for other heritage railways that followed afterwards. But most importantly, what the Tally Clin does is remind us that, no matter how rough or damaged you may be, all it takes is for folks to give a little love to make you special. Subscribe for more.